What is up everybody? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we are back with another Detroit Lions free agent profile type of video. And today, we're taking a look at a player that was with the Lions. He was drafted by the Lions in the first round. And now, a year later, he has made his way back to Detroit. Welcome back, Jared Davis. So let's get it started. Fired up. It's made a great decision. Great teammates, coaches, and other people who want to be Super Bowl champions, and we are. We're going to do it this year. And we're going places, because we want to go places. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Before long, we're they going to be the last one standing. And welcome, everybody, to our video. Glad you guys are here. We're back with another free agent video. And yes, I really do plan to make this shorter than our other free agent videos. With that being said, however, today we're taking a look at a player that was a very high draft pick by the Lions just a few years ago, back in 2017 in the Jim Caldwell era. It was actually the end of the Jim Caldwell era. He spent one season in that defense with Terrell Austin until Matt Patricia, Bob Quinn, those guys came in. Bob Quinn was actually already here. Scheme changed a little bit. He lands with the Jets this past offseason after his fifth year option was not picked up by the Lions. He signed to a one year, five and a half million dollar deal. Of course, they did not resign him. So now here he is again as a free agent and the Lions have him back in the building. And they definitely displayed that they were intrigued by this player the year he left the offseason he left they made it known that they were intrigued about bringing jared davis back but according to brad holmes he would they were outpriced they couldn't afford to bring him back and actually we're going to break into the schematic side of it but because of how it worked out i actually think it's better off that he probably wasn't here last season then he's back now not only does it save us some money but also for himself it probably would be a better situation that he's back now than being here last season but the lions got their guy back and if you're like what in the world World are you talking about when did Dan Campbell say this well let me give you a few quotes from Dan Campbell this was the offseason that he left to go sign with the New York Jets he starts with this Davis man one of the first things I circled was if we're running inside zone where we're running our 42 ace our lead draw and you are leading on number 40 man you better freaking be ready for him to drop his hat hit you right under the chin he will literally split your chin open and knock your hat off and, and luckily I have some clips for that. You're seeing the Bears one right now, right? The BAM! I mean, that is, that's legit. Okay, that's probably what he's talking about. He continues with this. This was actually on a, on a different time. This was according to Detroit News, where he told Detroit News this. Look, I can't tell you what we're going to do in free agency, but when you state it like ja that, Jared Davis, there's something about that guy, man. Things I hear about the way he was coached. That's something I definitely circle. Things I hear about the way that he was coached. And just knowing the ability and aggressiveness big part of his game he intrigues me he pop off the tape and you feel like man can we help this guy can we make this guy better that being said we're going to go through a little bit of a background how did he land with the detroit lions how did he make his path back here because in doing so we're going to talk about how schemes have changed what has kind of influenced around him i mean every position can be dependent on other things but linebacker can be very dependent and schemes are very important as well especially when you're that high of a draft pick and look this is not the first time us lions fans we've seen it we've seen a lot of high picks where this can be the case sometimes it just doesn't work out other times, a big factor is that, hey, you drafted a guy for this, and then shortly after, it was this. And he had to try to adjust, he had to try to make it work, and he just couldn't make it work. You could honestly even argue this past season with a guy like Jelani Tavai. That's not to say that Jelani Tavai would have made it if Matt Patricia was still here. However, you could argue the same type of thing. So you go back to the 2017 NFL Draft. Lions are coming off a playoff season. They just went 9-7. and seven. Now remember, this defense was originally built through the trenches. Terrell Austin was your defensive coordinator, and this was the defense that was originally the defensive line was dominant. And on can sue, you had the uh, Nick Fairleys, you had the Ziggy Yonses. I mean, this defensive line was nasty, the Cliff Averills. The defensive line was starting to lose some of those top guys, Sue was no longer there but they did have some depth in the interior as well as getting a guy like Ziggy Ansa back and at the linebacker core one thing the Detroit Lions didn't seem to have heading into that 2017 season was an aggressive linebacker that could make plays as a blitzer they didn't really have that so the Lions addressed it kind of twice with Jared Davis in the first round they came back in the fourth round it took Jalen Rose Maven out of Tennessee the Lions wanted guys that could be impactful possibly add some pass rush get creative within the second level because Terrell Austin was always known for again they had a great defense fine he was creative with his defensive schemes and getting after the quarterback but they didn't really have those guys and they were actually losing linebackers like the DeAndre Levies so they go get Jared Davis 
in the first round of 2017, pick number 21. Now, this was a player that was, a lot of people liked him coming out because they loved his leadership, the off the field, how hard he plays, which absolutely so shows up on his film. You see it even when he misses a play, going back to last year with the Jets, you could see he's very upset that he missed that play or he didn't make that play happen. He plays through injuries, which is something that he's even brought up after joining the Detroit Lions. That is something that he understands. Look, tape is king, and I can't be trying to play through injuries. He talked about, basically made it clear that he was playing through injuries with the Jets, and Robert Sala kind of backed it up and was like, yeah, that's true. He was playing through injuries, and we kind of rushed him back just trying to get him onto the field, trying to see what he could do because he was a one-year deal. You sign a prove-it deal, it's, you can't really not have him play because then it's like, well, what do we do with him? What, do we know what we can do with him? So they try to rush him back. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But in 2017, it was interesting because he came in and he was pretty much immediately the guy for the Lions. I mean, he was the Mike in a 4-3 defense led by Terrell Austin. Now, what was so great about this for Jared Davis is, as we said, what the Lions were looking for, an aggressive, leadership, blitzing linebacker. Davis was all of those things. He was that but he's also a guy that, you know, had to bulk up, get a little bit stronger because he had some injury issues. Even going back to college, talk about playing through those. He had a couple of games where he played through injuries. Very tough, but it, you could see that, yeah, he's playing through injuries. And if you just take that and you look at the Jets and you're like, okay, he's playing through injuries, that explains a lot why he looks like he does. He does not look like the same Davis, even from 2020. He just doesn't look like the same guy. Drafted into this defensive scheme, which I believe really fit him well. At the time, it really fit him well. It was aggressive. I would actually argue that this was his best season in the NFL as as a whole and on top of that statistically speaking just the numbers that he put up only playing in 14 games but starting all 14 of those games statistically he put up great numbers across the board he had 96 combined tackles which of course if he would have played in 16 games his career high so far is 100 in a season he would have blown right by that he had a fumble recovery he had an interception the only interception of his career he had two sacks he had four tackles for loss he had four quarterback hits Jared Davis was kind of finding his footing in the NFL but one thing that was a big story, and if you follow Pro Football Focus, you've probably heard this before, that the last six weeks of that rookie season for Davis, he took off. He was incredible in the last six weeks of the season, actually to the point where if you just take what Pro Football Focus grades as, through that span, the last six weeks of, of his rookie season, he graded out as the number four linebacker in football. I'm not just saying number four rookie linebacker, the number four linebacker in the NFL, including having dominant performances like Green Bay in the final game of the season, Chicago, Minnesota. So, like, this guy was outstanding to close the season. And one of the most obvious and biggest changes to that year was the fact that they moved Jared Davis off the field in obvious passing situations. And this is something that has kind of carried with him, but it just makes sense. There was the idea that he could play three downs in the NFL. He has enough athleticism, and he has a very big blitzing ability, which we'll talk about, which he can be a three-down player in the NFL. And I don't think he can't. I think he could be. But you really have to understand what position am I putting him in. And for the Lions, they started to kind of pull back some of the role to the point where he was playing about 98% of the snaps. And that dropped to about 75% of the snaps defensively. They started to take him off the field. If it's third and 14, take him off the field. If it's a situation where, hey, it's the last two minutes, you know they're passing every play, we'll take him off the field. That's what they kind of began to do. And, of course, what that does with Pro Football Focus grades, because they're an accumulation of all the grades, the pass coverage, the, the pass rush, it elevated everything else because of the fact that one thing that constantly holds his PFF grade down is his coverage grades. Before his rookie season, he earned a 52.8 overall Pro Football Focus grade with a 67.4 against run. That's a good grade. It's not great. It's not elite, but it's good. It's good. It's definitely something to build off of as a rookie. 75.2 as a pass rusher, so he picked up right where he left off from college. Big excitement was, man, he's going to be able to get after it. Picked up right where he left off in a 40.7 in coverage. Of course, the lowest grade there, and starting to take him off the field, it's no coincidence that, hey, if we take him off the field in obvious pass situations, his grade goes up. Well, that's because he can't be burnt in those situations. Clearly, you have to deal with if he's out there on first, second down, and they throw it, they're going to throw it. But with that said, if it's an obvious pass situation, and we take him off the field, it takes away that where his biggest weakness was at the time, which is the coverage. About being smart, but it's about playing fast and aggressive. Not thinking, play fast and aggressive. And that's kind of what the Lions, Dan Campbell, that coaching staff has come in and tried to do is, hey, let's play aggressive, let's play fast, let's not have guys thinking all the time, playing slower. So that was his rookie season. It led to a lot of optimism heading into 2018 because you're like, dang, there's something here. But then as we know, Jim Caldwell gets fired, new coaching staff comes in, enter Matt Patricia. Now slowly this started to evolve to the point where Jared Davis basically lost his role in the defense. And it's no shock at all that, yeah, he's not going to get his fifth-year contract picked up, which would have been about $10 million because of the fact that his role diminished. By the time he got to 2020, he was barely playing defensively. 
So you move to 2018, in comes this new defensive scheme. They're running the 3-4. It's the two-gap that, you know, Matt Patricia does. We always talk about bend, don't break. But it's also different for linebackers because you're more in the read and react, just like a defensive lineman, where you're not jumping and filling run lanes as a linebacker. You're a little bit more wait, see. You have two gaps that you're responsible for, just like a defensive lineman. So it's a completely different philosophy. Now, this transformation I'm about to talk about started in 2019, March of 2019, where they got the first pictures that he was at about 227. This continued through 2020 as he initially gained 18 pounds, went to 245, but they weren't cutting body fat. That's when they started to focus on his diet. He went for a guy that came out at about 237. That's what he was listed at. He bulked up to about 245 while also cutting some of the, the body fat. He was just bulking up, getting a lot stronger, which probably helped his transition. He tried to transition. He tried to make the fit into this defense. Actually, the reports were that he was about 227 and then they got him to about 245. So that's a big transition for your body, but they didn't want to lose athleticism they were just trying to make him stronger so statistically speaking not bad numbers just you know if you just look at by the eye test 100 total tackles six sacks 10 tackles for loss 10 quarterback hits a forced fumble eight passes defended i mean the stat line's really not bad on on, on paper right 17 pressures consistent throughout his career is he's gotten after the quarterback 2017 through 2020 not in the 2021 with the jets but through that span he was fourth in the national football league as a pass rushing off ball linebacker just in terms of success so this was a player that had a lot of success rushing the quarterback and that always translated you see it in the pff grades he had a 74.5 pass rush grade even in matt patricia's first season other things kind of dwindled and that specifically was run defense where rookie year you're thinking man look at the run defense and when i watched the film from the rookie year i'm very excited about what he is as a run defender we'll talk about it a little bit more but it's the other things we're like all right we have to kind of figure some things out here but that dwindled a 32.9 grade coverage actually was pretty good at a 64.5 now i think what helped in this season is not that they just took you know reps away from him because they actually played him a ton his rookie season i think what helped him is the responsibilities they were able to give him in 2018 because you got to think it's the first year of matt patricia coming in so he's slowly building the roster to the scheme that he wanted so you didn't really have all the pieces there yet I think 2019 you signed Trey Flowers, right? You're getting these new additions. So Jelani Tavise was 2019. But before that, you didn't have it. So it allowed Davis to be more flexible. And what I saw them do a lot is they would put him on the edge. If it's a pass down, he's on the field, but they would stick him out there on the edge. They would allow him either rush or he could drop into a flat, cover a tight end, cover running back on the backfield. And when he gave him those assignments, he was really fine. He was fine in those areas. So the coverage didn't actually dwindle. It was actually the run defense, which makes a ton of sense because having him sit read and react type of defense is nowhere near his skill set it just it's complete opposite it's like taking jared Goff and here's lamar jackson's playbook let's see what you can do with it doesn't make any sense doesn't fit him so there's no shock that the run defense really suffered he had numbers but that's just because he was on the field all the time and also in this game usually the linebackers are the guys that are picking up the bulk of the numbers moves you to 2019 now this is where we start to see his snaps go down a little bit at the same time, this was a lot of their big additions. Another little note to throw in there. In 2018, the Lions did acquire halfway through the season Snacks Harrison, which was a big addition to help their run defense as a whole. And then 2019, it kind of fell off, and it was like, all right, we cut him after that year, and it was a very, very big issue for the Lions defense. The issue here, of course, is the coverage. You look at 2018, he only allowed a sub-70% completion percentage, only eight yards per completion, two touchdowns, zero picks, and a 95.6 passer rating. Not bad. It's really not for a linebacker. But again, I thought they did a good job of a lot of opportunities they had to have him work underneath. They they did and I think Patricia saw that and they're like okay let's let's make sure that if he if we have an opportunity to let's try to keep him underneath in zone but slowly with how they wanted to form their defense it kind of pushed him out the door so you move to 2019 the guy plays 11 games starts 11 two sacks 63 combined tackles three forced fumbles a pass defended uh four tackles for loss five quarterback hits 11 pressures the coverage is where things started to get a little hairy he allowed a 79 percent completion percentage 12.5 yards per completion which is not good at all he actually allowed more yards this year than the past year on way less completions a touchdown no interceptions and a 116 passer rating he began the year as look he was your top guy he was again still your top off ball linebacker he was still you know the mic of that defense but with the guys like Jelani Tavai you start to see that hey Jelani Tavai can play on the edge so you start to get that kind of role taken away for Davis which put a little bit more on his plate but then you ultimately got to the point in that season where you got to week 10 against the Bears and this is where we saw them make a change uh, Matt Patricia started to get Jelani Tavai much more involved 
defensively. You start to see Davis again come off the field in obvious packages. Even some drives, they would just rotate him out, and his grade got better. No coincidence, again, because he's not on the field in those coverage situations. I think he was better as an off-ball run defender than he was as an edge run defender. So when you had the, you know, the additions on the edge, it helped him a ton. And a 72.4 pass rush. I mean, that continues to be the consistent with him. And then his final year with the Lions, 2020, the final year for Patricia with the with the Lions. And not a ton to talk about here. It's because his role kind of just fell off a cliff. He really just stopped playing in the Lions defense. And this was slowly happening. And it started to take effect in the end of 2019. You're like, okay, he's starting to lose his role. And then on top of that, 2020 comes around. They get the pieces. It's year three. Patricia has what he feels like, you know, can be the guys. Because you got to think of 2019. Think about the guys that were out. Kerry Hyder's out. Ziggy Ons is out, right? Those are two guys that fit two different schemes. They're out the door. Eli Harold's out. If you guys remember Eli Harold, new guys in. So you move to 2020, and his role pretty much goes away. He only starts four of the 14 games that he plays in. 46 combined tackles, a half a sack, a tackle for loss, four quarterback hits, eight pressures. 15 for 15 in coverage, not very good. Two touchdowns, only 9.2 yards per completion. 62.2 overall grade, a 50.8 against the run, 61.4 in pass rush, and a 72.1 in coverage, which again from, comes from limiting you know, those coverage plays. So that was 2020, but it was just kind of like the way out the door. Leads you to the New York Jets, signing the one-year $5.5 million deal with the Jets. Now, on the surface, moving to a 4-3, there was a lot of excitement there because it's like, oh, Jared Davis is going to kind of be back in his element. He was in this 3-4, two-gap, didn't really fit his style at all so this is good for him right this is a good spot for him to go now for the Jets this is a proven deal and it was the first year of Robert Sala but you also have to keep in mind where Robert Sala is coming from and what he knows for a defense background of a Pete Carroll and how they do things defensively you get a lot of 4-3 cover three shell out of that so of course they can slide a safety down the box give you a little bit of extra run support cover six so it's a lot more soft zone coverage i would say from this style of defense much less attacking like if you look at the san francisco 49ers maybe best defense season 2019 they go like 13 and 3 that year they barely blitzed the quarterback in 2019 they only blitzed 20.9 percent of the time yet they got pressure on almost 29 percent of plays so they had a lot of pressure but they didn't really have to blitz it was a very dominant defensive line but then you move to a season like 2020 and you kind of see the opposite where they're blitzing 33.5% of the time, but they're only getting 22% pressure. Of course, they go 6 and 10. The defensive line's not the same. So they have to crank up the aggression, which we saw the same thing with Patricia. You have to crank up the aggression to the point where it's like, man, we're just not getting pressure. So that's kind of where he's coming from. They cranked up the aggression a little bit with the Jets, but it wasn't like a, a main thing with Jared Davis. But there was a lot of excitement with Davis. There was talks like, look, he's already out there. He's making calls for the defense. He may be the green dot of this defense. And unfortunately for them, like we saw last year with the Lions, they had a lot of injuries that they had to deal with. A lot of injuries. And this offseason, of course, they went out, they got Jermaine Johnson. They have Carl Lawson. So, you know, he should be healthy, which should help them a ton. Um, their defensive line looks pretty good, but it really wasn't playing up to that. But they also had a lot of injuries within the front seven. So for them, they're going to need a very good defensive line to play the way that Robert Sala is kind of coming from, in my opinion. They will also need some of those longer, lanky corners like a Sauce Gardner, who they took in the top 10, and a DJ Reed that they picked up from Seattle. I don't know if that's ideal for Davis's skill set, but even on top of that, the injury definitely played a factor because I'm just going to be honest, plays that you saw in 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017, that you see him defending, same plays that he's defending in 2021, he just doesn't look right. He's not the most agile guy, he never really was, but he didn't look very fluid in terms of movement. He looked very bulky, he didn't seem to have that kind of closing burst that has been one of his trademarks. So I'm really hoping he comes back healthy because like you said, tape is king. And he understands that now, so he's got to stop, you know, maybe trying to play through all those injuries that he knows that I can't play through. That I'm not the same player. But Robert Sala admitted to it, it's like, dude, we wanted to get him back, which makes sense. He was on a winner deal. You weren't a very good team. We want to see this guy on the field and see what he can bring to this defense. Uh, but Robert Sala put a lot of it to the fact that the guy was hurt, the guy was injured, and he was excited to see him what he could do in Detroit because they were very excited about him all the way through the offseason. They said he had a good offseason. He had a good training camp. They played him as an off-ball backer in that defense, which I think makes sense if it's a skill set. But at the same time, again, it was a little bit more passive. It wasn't as aggressive. You saw like that 2017 Lions defense when they were getting after it with their backers, just in the play style. Not necessarily mean you're blitzing all the time, just in the play style. It was a little more passive. Linebackers are five, six yards off the line versus the Lions defense, who a lot of times will put you up three yards off the line of scrimmage, three, four yards. Be a little more aggressive with their 
their linebackers. Try to get creative with him. I thought on some packages, they, they would try to kick him out on the edge, allow him to get on the edge and rush, but he doesn't really seem to have ways to win the edge. Like to me, I watch him. He's a good blitzer, but that's not the same as winning the edge. That doesn't mean you're a defensive end. He didn't really have a way to win the edge, and I think some of that may have been ankle because he didn't look as explosive or change the direction, but still, I don't think he really has a lot of that. At the same time, they would do that on rundowns, right? They would only have one off-ball linebacker. They would kick him at the edge, and he could do a little bit there against the run, but it wasn't like he was an on-the-line Sam, which we've talked about with Julian and James. He was still an off-ball backer, but it was just kind of a mess with the New York Jets. So now here he is, back with the Lions. Obviously, the hope is that he comes back and he's healthy for the Lions. I think this could have worked out really well for the Lions because let's say he was here last year with our, the scheme movements that we had throughout the season and you know kind of the pieces that we still had along our defense. I don't know if it would have been ideal for Jared Davis either. And then you throw on top of the fact that he had an injury. If he would have had that same injury here, that would have been very rough because the Lions probably would have gave him a one-year deal. He would have had the same ankle injury that he was doing with the Jets. Are you trying to rush him back from injury? So that wouldn't have helped. And then automatically there probably would have been that you know kind of thing set either that he's hurt or he's not playing well. No one wants it back. The Lions just may not bring him back at that point. And then you also throw on top of the fact that he got paid five and a half million dollars. All right, and obviously it's set up a little bit different, but the Lions would have to give out some money, and like Brad Holmes said, we were kind of outpriced. That would have been a lot. Lions didn't have much cap at all last season. They had, they had like $50 million dead cap. They led the NFL. They had tons. So they didn't have much money to really spend on guys and give out these prove-it deals. So given that the Davis, maybe we don't see Charles Harris. Right, maybe we don't get to see what that guy was all about. So for us, I think it worked out actually pretty well that now he is back here, much cheaper deal. His contract he signed with the Lions as a 28-year-old linebacker is a one-year, one point zero four seven million dollar cap it that's his cap number for this season that didn't make any sense the way i read that but it's 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 just over a million dollar cap number for the season with no dead cap if he's cut so there's not those guarantees there so basically there's not really any risk to this signing if you cut him before the season okay we didn't lose any money the only risk is you're losing the roster spot i guess uh at the same time it can be up to basically 1.187 million dollars so it's not very expensive at all it's just one of those prove it deals but it's had a much cheaper version than it was last season and again hopefully he's coming back healthy now we've heard Calvin Shepard talk about it you know kind of with Jared Davis when he was here before it was off football and you know he was in a bad place being that high of a pick the expectation the scheme change it was all football for him and he was going through it Davis said that you know he would kick himself just like man why didn't I say that you know why, why didn't I say this if I didn't have the clear understanding of what we were trying to do defensively there was just a lot that he went through and to be back and I loved it because you know when I saw him at OTAs the guy was excited he was he said, felt genuinely excited to be back with the Detroit Lions be back here he's like man this is home so I really felt that with Davis that he was excited to be back in Detroit he's very familiar with this but at the same time with this coaching staff that had a vision for him a year out and honestly I mean his tape looked way better from those years than it did last year let's just uh, just be straight up and honest with that I don't know if I'll call this like a direct comparison but at the same time kind of a comparison so take a look at this Jared Davis versus Demario Davis now the reason I do this is because Demario Davis who was a third round pick back for the Jets 2012 he landed with the new orleans saints in 2018 it wasn't the same as it was with jerry because jerry was the first round pick but at the same time it was like up to that point he hasn't really figured it out and he's been in the league for about the same span as jared davis has so i thought hey, it's kind of a good comparison but he hadn't really figured it out at that point point. and i think when you look at davis and you look where he was coming from at least with the jets you could definitely see that schematically it was like this doesn't make sense this didn't fit demario davis's skill set it just didn't make sense for what he ultimately was good at and we saw that because when he was plugged in with the saints not only yes was their defensive line better which helped it was also on top of the fact that it just fit what he did well much better they immediately had him come in they plugged him in immediately as a weak side linebacker and he's been one of the the staples of kind of making the saints defense what we know today as the saints defense see the athletic traits and the similarities focus on jared davis first you're at a 4 6 2 40 coming out 1 5 7 10 yard split 23 bench rest reps 38 and a half inch vertical 7 3 9 cone drill which is very bad not very good and 33 and a half inch arms his agility scores are not good his speed was good his 10 yard splits very good i mean that's that's actually really good and uh, some solid bench rest numbers from him and as we said we're not really sure what he weighs right now last season he looked bigger i would say he's probably in the 245 range i'm okay if he lost some of that weight and got back to the 230 i mean i mean i'm just saying but again he did bulk up they said reportedly he was about 227 with the lions so maybe that's more like what he was playing at in 2017 and i thought he looked really good that I actually thought he looked his best in 2017 and then he bulked up got stronger 
for that Patricia defense partially as well. And that's when he was listed out coming out was 238. Um, and then you see Demario Davis, and you can just see the similarities across the board. Aside from the bench rest reps, you can see the similarities across the board. Bad agility scores. You could see it, though, and how these guys test out. And for Demario Davis, plugs in. Now he's like the guy of that defense, or a lot of people know Davis from that defense. And he's been outstanding. He was actually the best graded linebacker in 2020. There are things that excite you, and that's why I wanted to start off by talking about the schemes and the changes there, because I think it's very crucial when you talk about what his strengths are, because if you don't understand what he was playing in and how it was different, then it's hard to know really can he be effective as a run defender i just look at his pff grades, like, eh, he's not a very good run defender well that doesn't tell me anything because that's not the, the spot that he was playing in so with that said what do i like about him as a run defender and i've watched all three i've watched not every game but i've watched through all four years or five years um 2017 18 19 20 and 21 most of it, I, I watched a lot of 2017. I watched all the games in 2021 with the Jets. So I have a very good feel of those two years specifically. Watched some good amount of games 2018, a little bit less of 2019 and some of 2020. So I watched all the seasons. What do I like? Well, let's just keep it simple. First off, he is a downhill. He is a run defending downhill linebacker that, as Dan Campbell says, will split your chin open he's going to get under your pads and he's going to split your chin open as if he's the lead guy and that is very very clear now he got stronger and you saw with the jets that's something that was still there with the jets well he definitely didn't look the same in his movement he showed a lot of power and he has always seemed to have that is the bench press reps don't necessarily reflect how much he puts into each punch that he delivers it's incredible he, he delivers a big blow to offensive linemen fullbacks tight ends and that's something i think dan campbell's intrigued by because he doesn't have to be the strongest guy but man he will light you up and that's the mentality that he's always had coming out of the, coming out of the draft is he's that aggressive very strong pursuit he's gonna hit you a leader in terms of and doesn't mean he has to say a whole bunch but he leads by example like he's playing at a hundred percent all the time and that can get him into issues but you absolutely love it like you can live with it. i feel like you can live with it if you have him in the right defense pretty smooth working downhill as a run defender so again we go back to 2017 because i love his 2017 i love his 2017 run defending film and the way that he's able to fill gaps he's very smooth working downhill where he can kind of transition shift his body weight based on the lane that he needs to fill he has an ability to do that and also shows up at times evading offensive linemen specifically against a zone run the ability to evade offensive linemen working up to the second level and continue to pursue the running back that is an absolute ability of his to kind of trigger but also be very smooth in his transitions downhill not super agile but we're talking about attacking attacking style but being able to kind of shift his body weight navigate a little bit as he works downhill at the same time, I like the way that he utilizes and sees guard movement. If a guard pulls, he quickly triggers to that. So if he has this, you know, I got to fill the B gap, all of a sudden the guard pulls, he quickly triggers to that and makes an adjustment to it. So for him, he just looks very smooth as a downhill linebacker, which makes sense because that's what he came out to be chase down zone runs this is something that actually translated even in the patricia defense because while it was read and react when he was on the opposite side of a zone run and he's chasing it down you still got to see all, all that athleticism that he had and his ability to chase down lay a big hit i like is that's where you get those big hits because for him he just runs through you like he will miss tackles and we're gonna get to that big issue but he runs through tackles as well. So if it's his own run, he's in a chase down situation. He's running right through the guy. I absolutely love it. Facing lead blockers. Again, we said guards, tight ends, fullbacks. If he's the first guy through, he's going to make you feel it. He's absolutely going to make you feel it, which is great because it, you know, can free up kind of the second guy through. He's got that lane to fill and he's not backing away. He is going to ram into you. It's, it's incredible. Now, just because he's only responsible for one gap does not mean he's not taking on offensive linemen. You definitely have to take on linemen, especially when you're working downhill. And that's where that punch, that kind of blow that he can deliver to offensive linemen while being able to hold his ground could come in handy. But you saw the 2017. Watch him fill the A gap here. Sit down. Boom. Into the center and be able to fill that lane cleanly and make the play. And it puts a lot of pressure on you to fill that one gap when you're in that style of a defense. You see the push there he gets on the guard, not allowing that open lane. He has a good ability of is forcing cutbacks, forcing guys to jump back inside between the tackle box. I want to specify there because outside of tackle box, I haven't really seen as much. It showed up a little bit as an issue with the Jets, but his movement just didn't look right. With that said, though, between the tackles, his ability to force cutbacks, to force guys to jump back inside. 
between the tackle box is great because he plays a very good leverage game. It's not rare to see him bite down on play action because of how quickly he tries to get downhill, reading off the initial blocking scheme. Are they working in a zone block scheme? Are they working upfield? And then he moves and he squeezes these B gaps quickly to get downhill. And this is where you see him force cutback lanes. He'll force guys back the other way if it is a run play. And this is where he can make a very big impact even if he's not making the if tackle. If the center, you know, is trying to kind of block him off, he'll put his shoulder down and just ram him back into the pocket. Zone run is coming his direction he'll pull his shoulder down and just jack that guard back out of the play and force the running back to kind of have to bounce back for a second because hey he's already here because that's the style that suits him he is a guy that's built for you look you can't have him sit there okay diagnose this that it shows up in cover two we'll talk about it it's look this is what you got to do go do it Go do it. Play with instincts. Play fast. Don't think. Just go. We'll live with the results. You saw that against the Bears, the Vikings, man. You saw some outstanding reps. Now, continuing, I think he has fantastic pursuit. And this is effort. This is kind of that leadership we talk about, leading by example. His pursuit's outstanding. I love the way that he continues to fight and work within plays is great. You get the forced fumbles this way. But, man, he just keeps working. And you can tell, like, he's upset when he doesn't make the play. So that leads you to very inconsistent tackling. It's been an issue since he's joined the NFL at the same time it's something that needs to be cleaned up but it was also an issue coming out of college is that the guy would miss tackles he'd miss a lot of tackles part of it is because of the style that he plays another part you want to see is just more consistent so we'll see how they can develop him there but since he's you know joined you, go, you can't see 2017 they don't have the advanced stats but 2018 for 18 missed tackles 15 percent 2019, 13% missed tackles. 2020, 15% missed tackles. 2021, 16.5% missed tackles. Now, that one's a little bit different. We'll talk about why because it's a much smaller sample size. It was 25 tackles, 5 missed tackles, and it just looked different. I mean, it looked different. But at the same time, the guy misses tackles in a couple different ways. First off, he leaves his feet. And we talked about it was a chase down, zone run defender. You know, guys don't really see you coming. You're just rolling right through them. That looks perfectly fine. But at the same time, he will leave his feet. And I think a lot of this stems from some of his lack of agility, lack of ability to, to kind of make that second effort. Like for him, he doesn't really break down in the tackles, especially when he's chasing. Understandably so. He's trying to get there and make the play. But he doesn't really have that agility to kind of recover. So if a running back shows I'm upfield, he's trying to pursue, chase down. All of a sudden, he slows up for that. Then the running back goes again. He doesn't really show that fluidity to kind of match it. Then all of a sudden, he leaves his feet. And that's when you get missed tackles. He will overrun plays. That's not rare either where a running back will stop and boom, he's just running right past you. We've seen him miss a lot of sacks in the same way. He just runs right past whoever has the ball. He does that a lot. He overruns tackles. It's very normal for him because he doesn't consistently break down. And sometimes it's fine because like, hey, he's got to chase that down, make a play in the backfield. Other times, like, man, if you just broke down a little bit there, you're just out of control. But this is something that I think may have actually improved potentially because the defense that he was in is trying to stay under control, but still it's shown up as an issue, and I think a lot of it is because he leaves his feet. But at the same time, I think another issue just as a run defender is he can take steep angles. You will see him get caught taking very steep run angles, and that can get him into trouble. You have the ability to get back outside, and that's when blockers can wall him off between the tag box. Doesn't happen a ton, but you do see it from time to time see maybe more ways to disengage from a blocker when they kind of get latched on once they get in that situation he can evade pretty well and he does have a very nice punch maybe just more ways where once they get latched on finding a way to still disengage at that point hopefully that's not a huge part of this scheme for him where he has to, you know that's gonna be something that you consistently see but it is something i would like to see is maybe just more ways technically to disengage once he gets latched on by an offensive lineman but i think there's a lot to like his run defender and again you have to differentiate him as a run defender in 2017 versus really everything else because it's it's different it's a completely different style it's a completely different ask so while I don't love him in these two-gap systems, I thought Patricia made a good point. He wasn't next to like a 10-year veteran trying to adjust to this defense. Here he's at Mike Linebacker. You see the two-gap across the defensive line. He takes on the lead blocking fullback. No one really wraps around to the outside. Raglan, you know, gives up kind of that inside gap as he's pulled out by the offensive tackle on this plane. There's no one to fill it there. So as they fill it at basically the exact same time, there's no one on the outside gap of this play. And that's kind of accumulation of a lot of things. This was a good rep against the Packers. And of course, as we know, it's very important to be able to have these interior defense linemen that can take on these double teams. You see the patience there slides down. He's able to be kept clean at the second level. So that transitions you into pass coverage. Pass coverage is an area where I think 
Run defense, I think he'll fit in really well. We'll talk about the role at the very end. But pass coverage is an area where I feel like he may be a little bit more limited, but you really want to understand what position am I putting him here in coverage. Because you're going to be in coverage spots if you're on the field. First, second, down, third. You're going to be in coverage spots. just going to happen. So what can he do in coverage? Well, first thing is that he does have an ability to open his hips and run up the seam. But he does have that ability. He's not the most agile, but to, to just transition where open your hips turn and run and chase now is he going to be a playmaker at the catch point i don't know probably not he hasn't really shown that but he can chase turn and run with a guy he does have enough speed where most tight ends aren't going to give him problems in that area so there is that ability and that shows up in like tampa 2 where they'll put him in those zone drops where he has to drop deep middle this was a play towards the end of the 2017 season where just a little bit of a fall step on the outbreaking round. He's a little bit late to get back to help up the seam which leaves there's a small window for the quarterback to put the pass in but he looks pretty athletic on that play versus I don't like him sitting back and trying to break around he's never been much of a playmaker at this spot either he's reading the quarterback's eyes on this play and he has kind of still a late plant also notice he's planting off that left foot or that left ankle which is where he had the injury he hasn't shown to be much of a playmaking presence in some of these deep, deep zone drops or maybe he doesn't have a man or an assignment that he's kind of sitting with instead he's just dropping with his eyes making some fluidity you did see to me a little bit more of a field general feel playing the middle linebacker position for the Jets passing off these under underneath routes and these are preseason clips so you can see the movement skills definitely look to move a lot better in the preseason but still not much of a playmaker at the catch point here up the scene the strength here is that closing chase down ability it is that closing speed and this shows up with running backs in the flats running backs underneath running back screens this is where it shows up if you keep that assignment simple for him and this is why he'd be great in a quarterback spy like if you had him walk up on the line and spy the quarterback or if you just have a running back leak out of the backfield and he has to go kind of sit on that this is where this is where he's at his best because he just closes that space i like it. he doesn't really seem to get caught too often trying to turn his head and find the ball when he's chasing down he is locked on you can't do that once you're behind this is where he shows sub package bin and show. I love his ability to get up on the line, read the running back, read that it's a screen, and not attack and make a play on the he running back. He can work some of the tight end crossers and cut off the crossing routes, but that's where he is as a coverage player. That's where you want him as a coverage coverage player more often than not. He's very smooth underneath when if there's two off-ball linebackers in the game, running back in the backfield, hey, if he goes my side, I got him. If he goes your side, you got him. A simple situation that they put him as a coach, if you can allow yourself to do that, then now he's playing his fastest. So, hey, running back comes my way. He takes him out of the backfield. Running back goes your way. I'm going to transition that until I'm going to rush the quarterback. And what I like is that I've seen him make up mistakes by just playing fast. Listen, the Cowboys game, the game that we lost where Zeke Elliott over top, we'll talk about that. But in the Cowboys game, Dak Prescott rolled out. Now, what he does, another thing well in coverage, is that he is very tunnel vision to me. And some of this, again, could have grown. We just kind of have to see it because he was very young at this time. When he sees his assignment and you give him kind of a small like triangle to, to be aware of, he's fine in that. So, for example, he's good passing off those underneath routes. He could be fine if, like, okay, here's my linebacker helps here. Here comes the tight end through. I'm passing it off to you. He's uh, running back out the backfield, pass that off to his side linebacker. So, immediately he does that. He takes off after Dak Prescott. What I like is there's not that hesitancy to be like, wait a minute, did I miss something? Did I pause? I got to go because if I stop and wait... If I made a mistake, okay, but I got to minimize that by just going. If I think about it, you have issues. He'll do that play action sometimes too, where it's like, hey, running back, he didn't get the ball, attack the quarterback. But he's very good at this. He's very good at this. Like, hey, ball, ball didn't go to running back, immediately get to the quarterback. So he's very good at kind of hiding some of those. In this play against Dak, you see that there's kind of the late tight end that comes behind the line of scrimmage, and he doesn't see that. He's already going after the quarterback. If you were to pause there, kind of be in between, that's probably a touchdown. But because he just gets after Dak immediately, makes it a tough throw, falls incomplete. Thing is, though, the back's flip side of that is that, yes, he can be a little bit tunnel vision in my eyes. He kind of sees like a triangle where it's not rare to see him run into his own teammates. Here comes some crossing routes. I'm on the opposite side. I ran into my teammate. It's not rare to maybe not know where everybody is on the field. He kind of knows where, like, hey, here's my assignment. Here's my man. Here's ball. Maybe I got this other route that I have a grasp on. For example, in zone coverage, like cover two, they did a lot. Uh, if you have him in a cover six, cover two, any, any of those roles underneath where it's like, okay, here's the seam. He jumped up the seam. Let me get back down underneath and pick up this underneath, you know, flat from the outside receiver. That's cool. You can transition that. Seeing the entire field... I haven't noticed that as a big strength in his game yet. He doesn't seem to see everything that's going on. So teams can fool him in that way, but that's so far why we always say, like, hey, you got to limit what you're putting on his plate. Let him play fast. So like how in zone coverage early, especially when you show blitz, Lions love to do this with their linebackers. So if he is out there on a sub package, when they show blitz, though, and then they have them drop, he finds receivers very quick. He finds where his zone receiver is quick. So, okay, I got to drop into this 
hook curl zone. So I'm dropping first steps back, find the receiver, then get my eyes back on the quarterback. He does that very quickly, very smooth without stopping his back pedal and still creating depth. So that's very fluid. I think that's why people that man, there's some upside here. He could possibly play three downs in the NFL, but then there's the backside of it where in that same scenario, quarterback's eyes give him issues in zone coverage they do because it's not that he gets completely lost it's that he doesn't always finish the play that's at hand because what will happen is that you saw on the, on the Zeke big play we've seen it in the past before where he'll get caught flat-footed completely flat-footed he's got he's got the running back on the backfield he'll just be standing there flat-footed he'll get caught flat-footed against Zeke like he did when he got beat over top he got he got flat-footed against tight ends from time to time now he can recover usually better against those guys but anybody with speed matching his or better he can get caught flat-footed and a lot of times it seems to stem from one if he's sitting and squatting and he's trying to okay hey first cut I'm jumping on that right I'm not expecting this to go deep downfield or also number two and, and if you don't have safety help you got to be aware of that and zone coverage and even if he finds his man early gets near him he doesn't always finish that because he'll start to lose that assignment towards the, the catch point because quarterback size fool him I saw it against the Bears saw it against the Packers of course P Trubisky got him Here's an example of being caught flat-footed. You see the pump fake by Rodgers and then putting his eyes the other way while the running back kind of shows block. He's flat-footed until the running back runs by him and then he's unable to adjust to the second move. They also gave him issues because in these man coverage assignments, they could try to take advantage just like maybe Dallas did or the Chiefs did where they put a receiver in the backfield. And he's a downhill, as we said, type of defender that lacks some of that change of direction and smooth agility. That gave him issues there. And even here, just a flat out of the backfield, again, Chiefs did this well where you have these tight routes makes it a little bit less room for him to get outside and then you have a speed receiver get to the flat where they'll just kind of give him one peek aside and he'll leave even though he knows hey look he communicated with me take him so I got to stick there he'll still jump off to the side because of the fact of the eyes so again that to me may be an area because he's got taken off of so many sub packages where there still could be improvement there through the years but at the same time with the Jets I thought his eyes were much better in zone coverage at passing off two-man concepts things like that he just athletically didn't look right jumping downhill he just did not look right well this is part of the reason that playing him as a will linebacker probably will be tough and we've seen him get beat on bootlegs before but to see him go down like this really unable to like plan off his left foot and recover at all just did not look right athletically that's what I've kind of gathered from that at least is that with the Jets having him sit back and in deep zone coverage is not his strength can he turn and run yes can he chase down yes having him drop deep in his zone coverage use fluidity to change direction because he's not very agile it's one of his biggest weaknesses you saw that his relative athletic score doesn't fit him it does and his eyes he's kind of all over the place it's not good for him so for me you want to keep him out of those situations now sometimes it happens but the more shallow underneath situations like that, he's better in those spots. Another area which I will give him some credit, though, I thought he was actually pretty good against tight ends. Uh, I didn't really see him give up many receptions. The only time I saw him give a reception to tight ends is if it was a cover three zone drop, right, and they get out to the flats, which is a weakness of cover three. Unless you're playing cover three flat, you got a guy immediately getting out there. You can give up the flats. It happens. It happened with the Jets all the time, and he'll probably get knocked for that, but it's like, hey, that's the zone drop. So things like that, if he was sitting off in deep zone coverage, again, this comes back with the Jets, and he's kind of jumping down, making the play. That that gave him issues however what didn't give him issues is that is that if you kind of squat sit and wait and play man coverage on a tight end now this could come from playing up on the line could play a little off the line but man coverage on tight ends wasn't bad or chasing down the route wasn't bad because usually most tight ends didn't have the ability to make him pay even when he got caught a little bit flat-footed because he could usually get some contact in transition with those guys with that said, guys like Kyle Pitts, things like that, I would expect they would probably give him some bigger problems than what we've seen. See him just a little bit more on his toes. He does get flat-footed too often. But I think there there is things that he can do in coverage. But to this point, overall, he just has not been a playmaker. So I wouldn't expect him to be like, well, he might pick off some passes. Like, no, I don't even see him as a sub-down player. So... If you had to do it, maybe you could in a pinch, but you probably don't want to. That's just what teams have kind of concluded. At least at this point, maybe the Lions can figure something else about him. Finally, I, finally, I want to touch on his pass rushing ability because it's probably his biggest strength. And not to spend too much time here, the numbers speak for themselves. He gets after the quarterback. Yes, he's left sacks on the table. He's left opportunities there because he's ran by sacks. At the same time, though, sometimes these aren't even blitzing assignments where he'll get to the backfield and get chase the quarterback and force him to throw it away because of, hey, running back didn't get it. I filled my lane. I'm immediately getting the quarterback. Why just sit here and do nothing? It was a play action. Go get the quarterback. That is such a smooth transition. He's like a heat-seeking missile for the football. I mean, he really is, and that's probably why his eyes are so crazy in zone because he just has, like, I'm locked on. I'm going there. And it is. 
it sometimes it's good. Like there was a play against the Vikings where he's passing off these underneath routes. He picks up his guy in the backfield, but he still finds the quarterback. So as the receiver gets up field, instead of like, okay, I'm only got my guy. Here goes the quarterback. He spun around, got off, and stopped the quarterback for a minimal game. So sometimes it's good, but that's underneath zone coverage. That's where he's got to play. Very aggressive, very tough for running backs, has good burst upfield. He's had a lot of success in stunt work where if you show him on a blitz and then all of a sudden you have a stunt inside outside more out more outside inside he's had had a lot of success in stunt work as well shift his body weight a little bit as a pass rusher and get after the quarterback but again he's one of those players where it's just like yeah no worries about being blocked i'm running through you to the quarterback you can stand in my way but you're just basically a roadblock the cons is doesn't really have ways to win the edge so that's one of my biggest knocks of well can he play sam i think he could but do I see much pass rush there? I don't really see it. I mean, I he could if it's a terrible assignment by the tight end or something. But at least right now, from what I've seen, I don't see him winning the edge very often, especially with the Jets. He just, again, didn't look right. To me, that's the difference between James Houston and Julian is that they have that ability. He hasn't really shown that ability as a pass rusher. For Sam, when you talk about what his potential role is, Sam is possible because I think he could play up on a light with tight ends. We saw the Jets sometimes put him on the edge. Now, question is, what does he look like? I don't know what he looks like. Calvin Shepard spoke highly of him. Like, hey, look, this is a guy that, you know, he understands it. He's been in the league. They have passed together. So, you know, you could put Davis at this spot and he knows what to do. You could put him here. You could put him there. Just experience. He has a lot of experience. So, understanding that. And I'm sure that if you put him in this assignment where it's like, hey, we got one gapping, aggressive defense, we're attack and react he could probably fit a lot better because to me, you can plug him in at either off-ball linebacker position. The Saints historically have been pretty flexible with that. If they go two off-ball linebackers and the extra DB comes, whether it's in the box or just on the field, they've been very flexible with, okay, you're on the strong side, you're on the weak side of the formation. Sometimes they'll flip, sometimes they don't. They've shown linebackers that have been able to be flexible with that. So Davis may be able to be flexible with that, which could make it intriguing. To me, though, I like him as an off-ball backer. I like him as an off-ball. If he looks anything like he did even in 2020, I like him off-ball. But I want to see where he's at because his movement didn't look right. But again, it's just hard to tell with the scheme. With that said, though, I like him as an off-ball backer. I like him aggressive. If you're not playing aggressive, I don't know why you signed him. Straight up, no idea why you signed a guy. I just don't see it. I mean, we've seen it for years. It doesn't work. Why sign him? He's got to be aggressive. And to me, if he's that, I like him as an off ball. Get the weak side. Um, to me, it's just you have to understand that in coverage, you have to make sure that he's most of his situations are you want to play underneath or you want him rushing the quarterback. He can drop and get depth in situations, but he's not a playmaker down there. And Final thoughts on the position. First off, I would just say, think about what Jalen Reese maybe was able to do last season, right? It wasn't perfect, but he had the best season of his career. Obviously, he made big time clutch plays for us. Jared Davis has been incredible. He just attacks the football when he hits. He constantly gets forced fumbles he plays with fantastic effort so just keep in mind the guy that came out of the same draft a fourth round pick that just had the best season of his career what potentially the Lions could get out of Jared Davis this season to me a lot of it comes from what does he look like athletically and health wise for the Detroit Lions does he look right I know he's not going to be the most agile player he probably law has lost some since he's coming to the league and he is a little bit more bulked up now but what are we getting athletically and health wise however when I'm talking about position if you're going to play him at Sam Backer that that would probably be a fine position for him in coverage because it would limit his coverage responsibilities. He'd be working with tight ends close off the line of scrimmage, playing the flats. There wouldn't be a lot probably put on his plate in those situations which he could handle. However, when it comes to pass rush, I don't know how much pass rush upside you're getting in comparison to a Julian or a James Houston who showed dip, bend, ability to win the edge, a little bit more explosiveness. Those guys would have much more upside winning that spot than a guy like Jared Davis would. And of course, this is just kind of like an early down run defense type of pack. It's more of your heavy package because so much now you play sub package in the NFL so if he's playing Sam he may give you a little bit of pass rush ability against tight ends possibly going to some bull rush he has shown some in and out outside inside specifically stunts is usually where he's at his best as a run defender it could be okay because of his length or he could be okay sitting the edge and then when you want to play him as an awful backer I like him as the Mike sliding towards the strong side playing as a Mike linebacker a guy that with his experience could be a pretty intelligent player in this defense that could be a little bit flexible and versatility you just have to understand the responsibilities you're putting on him versus your will linebacker what you're going to be asking to do because as we said Alex Malcolm those are the guys that move well they move much better in space but most of the time now you're in sub package more than half the time so in those spots for Jared Davis, I just have to understand what he's good at. I'm playing him up north towards the line, allowing him to either pass rush by the quarterback because there are some mobile quarterbacks now, or having him play underneath coverage. He can drop, get some depth in coverage, but he hasn't shown to be any sort of playmaker really down the field at all. When he makes plays, it's behind the line of scrimmage, it's screens, it's things like that. So you have to keep that in mind. Ideally, 
obvious pass downs, not sub package, obvious pass downs where it's third and 15, where it's, hey, it's two minute drill. He's not on the field. That's Alex Anzalone. That's Malcolm Rodriguez, who also gives you pass rush ability. That's those guys. Sub package, he can be on the field, just have to understand where he best suits. Aside all that, I just like him as an off-ball linebacker at a 4-3 aggressive attacking defense. Question is, will it work out? I don't know. I don't. But I know that he's happy to be back. I'm excited to have him back. There's no risk with the signing, so why be mad about it? If it works out, awesome. It'd be a great story, and uh, it'd be one that I'm here for. I believe this fits him, and I know this is optimistic, but again, I see it where it's like, dude, if, honest, if, if I could take that 2017 Jared Davis and just throw him into this year, I would be excited. I'd be so darn excited. There's a reason so many people are so excited to come out because he's is a leader. You see it. The effort's outstanding. He just, this, oh, I really hate to see how his path has been to this point. And I'm hoping that we get some of that old JD back because, my gosh, that guy will hit. And if he's, I'm telling you, like, like Dan Campbell said, if he's the lead guy through, if he's the first guy through as the Mike linebacker, they run to the strong side. Because, again, if he's Mike and they run away from the, the strong side, he's fine. He's going to be chasing it down. They run it to the strong side. He's filling the B gap. And all of a sudden, bam, he's going to light that fullback up. He's going to light that guard up. You're going to feel it. And then after that, he'll rush the quarterback. Like, that is a Saints linebacker all in all to me. Allow Alex Anzalone to be more of the dropping. He is one of the most fluid defenders we have. Very fluid change of direction. Malcolm Rodriguez is very fluid change of direction. Movement skills. Those are guys that can get dropped deep. It's why a lot of uh, former safeties play Will because it makes sense for like a guy like Malcolm Rodriguez, even though he's very good against run. Not going to go into all that. But Jared Davis's limitations from what we've seen so far. Unless they can figure something else out. Allow him to play closer to the line. Allow him to chase running backs out of the backfield. Tight ends, I think he's actually shown to be good. We'll see how they look at that. But run defense, man, he could be a tone setter early downs. And the Lions struggled so much to stop the run. Where defensive line should help. But it doesn't hurt to get linebacker help. To me, I think if he makes the team, he'll be in a rotation with the guys like Derek Barnes, possibly backing up Derek Barnes. And it's fine. If he's our fifth linebacker, I'm happy about that depth. Plus, keep in mind, he's been a special teams player with the Jets. So he's played a lot of special teams. He'll play field goal block, kick coverage. He'll play special teams for you. So there is that ability as well. So it's not like he can't do that. So for me, I like it. I, I think he will make the team. I think Kelvin Shepard's a fan of him. I think they're a fan of his versatility. And I think he's going to be a Detroit Lion this season. And we may see him a little bit on the field. Let me know your thoughts, comments below. Thank you for watching. And I'm out.